Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. My name is Julie Elkins and I am the Community Relations Coordinator for Altman Hospital. I have the pleasure of introducing Brandy Hahn today. Um, it, she's been an oncology nurse for over 24 years and Brandy has worked in many areas of the cancer care, including chemotherapy administration, clinical research, and nurse navigation in Altman Hospital. She's currently the nurse navigator for Altman Alliance Community Hospital. As a nurse navigator, she works with cancer patients, their families and physicians to help educate and coordinate cancer care uh, for cancer patients. She also participates in the cancer screening events along with educational events for the cancer programs. So welcome Brandy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Julie. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about a very important subject, um, HPV vaccinations, and what exactly is HPV? Um, so we'll kind of jump right into this. So should be plenty of time at the end. You know, if you have any questions, I'm open to those. Uh, so we'll go ahead. So the first is, what is HPV? HPV is also known as a human papilloma virus. It's an infection that can cause warts in various parts of the body. And where those warts occur can just kind of depend on the strain of the HPV infection. And there are, you know, within that, those different strains, about 75% of those strains actually do cause the warts. Um, as you see there, that there's roughly about 100 additional, you know, 100 different types of HPV infections. Um, there's roughly 30 that actually put patients at high risk to develop cancer. And the most common of those are the HPV 16 and HPV 18. Um, those are the ones that really are associated most frequently with head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, even cancers of the uh, anus as well. Um, this is a the most commonly trans uh, sexually transmitted infection. Um, it's passed through the vagina, the anal canal, and oral sex with skin-to-skin -skin contact. And we see about 3 million cases here in the U.S. And that's just of the HPV. That's not cancer. That's just the HPV infections. So if we take all of those 3 million cases and, you know, this, these HPV infections can lead into a cancer diagnosis. So if there's any way we can help prevent that, we want to do that. And we'll get more into that as we pro um, proceed through the presentation. So what are the risk factors in terms of developing an HPV infection? Our increased number of sexual partners, that increases our risk. Even if you only have one sexual partner, if your partner has had multiple partners, then that does put you at a greater risk as well, even though maybe that person is your only partner and has ever been your only partner. Um, age is also a risk factor. So gener the genital warts often occur most often in adolescents and young adults through, um, through sexual contact. If you have a weakened immune system, um, that can also increase your risk of developing HPV. And there's many different reasons why we can have a weak immune system. Um, any open sores or skin punctures in that, in the area, um, whether it's in the genitals or in the lip mouth area, that's another common location that we see the HPV infection. Um, touching of the warts and not wearing protection in, can increase your risk as well. Um, more than 50% of people who have had sex will have HPV at some point in their life, but most of the HPV vaccines, or I'm sorry, HPV infections do clear and go away on their own and cause no long-term effects. Um, and then of course, chronic infections can lead to other health problems as well. So symptoms of HPV, how do you know you may have HPV? Genital warts, or surrounding skin, often affecting the vulva um, in women, or the penis and scrotum in men that may appear in the groin area as well. The warts may just, you know, look like a common wart that you might get on your hand, you know, maybe white or fleshy tone color, um, but most of them are benign. 
most HPV infections are benign, but we do have some that do lead to cancer. And that's kind of what we're focusing on today, are those ones that lead to cancer. Uh, how can we lower our chances of getting an HPV infection? This is just an HPV infection in general. This is not specific to cancer at all at this point. Um, of course, abstinence, you know, something we preach to our young kids right. all the time. Uh, limiting the number of sexual partners that we have and choosing a partner that has had no sex or few sexual partners. That's all going to lower our risk. No. The use of a condom can reduce, but may not eliminate that uh, risk. And then we do have the HPV vaccinations that are available. So we'll kind of go into that a little bit here as well. Um, the HPV vaccinations are primarily for our younger children, but they have come out in um, the CDC has come out with some updated guidelines for older people as well. Um, so screening for HPV related diseases for cervical cancer. There's two tests that are available. The pap test that most women get, you know, usually once a year, you know, the your GYN or family doctor takes a look. Um, and then there is specific an HPV test that goes along with that PAP test. Um, low income women or somebody with no health insurance, they may actually be a bit, uh, eligible for free cervical cancer screenings through the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. That's a national program. It's offered here in um, Ohio. So that might be available if somebody doesn't have insurance or low income. Anal and penile cancers and even the oral pharyngeal uh, cancers, there's really no good routine screenings that we can do. It's not like a mammogram that we say, oh, go get your mammogram every year or even a colonoscopy where you should start that at 50. You know, there's for anal and penile cancers and even the oral pharyngeal cancers of the head and neck, there's just no approved tests. So as far as the um, head and neck cancers or the oral pharyngeal cancers, the best thing that you can do is good dental hygiene and getting that yearly evaluation. Um, if anyone's been to the dentist recently, they'll lift up your tongue, have you look both sides, you know, and that's what they're looking for is any early signs of a cancer in there. Uh, Cervical or head and neck cancers. Cervical cancer guidelines, nearly all cervical cancers are caused by HPV. That's not to say all of them are, almost all of them are. And it might take 20 years. So you might develop that HPV infection when you were a teenager and you may not develop the cervical cancer until you're in your late 20s, 30s, 40s, um, because that HP and HPV infection never cleared completely on its own. Um, so screenings just for cervical cancer should begin around the age of 21 or whenever you become uh, sexually active. And then a pap test is recommended roughly every three years. Uh, most of the GYNs I think have you come back a little sooner than that. Um, age 30 to 65, those pap tests every three years and then every five years for HPV DNA testing. Uh, and then you can stop over the age of 65 if you've had three normal pap tests. But that stopping any screenings really is a conversation you should be having with your doctor. Because there's other reasons why you go in to see your doctor. Um, so really that conversation should occur with your physician. And then head and neck screening guidelines, like I said, there really is no good screenings for head and neck cancer. Um, just get that good dental exam every year. Um, every so often we do offer, uh, I know Altman Hospital has offered a head and neck screening in the spring where we have one of our physicians do a good uh, oral exam um, on patients. Uh, HPV infections increases risk of developing the following. So if you have an HPV infection, uh, cervix, uh, it increases your risk of developing cervical cancer. 70% of our cervical cancers are due to those two main HPV infections that I talked about back in the 
first one or two slides, the HPV-16 and HPV-18. Those are our two biggest cancer risks for cervical cancer. 65% um, of our vulva cancers and about 50% of our vaginal cancers are related to HPV infections. And then you see that 35% of our penile and about 90% of our uh, anal cancers are related to the HPV-16 um, infection. About 80% of our um, oropharynx, base of tongue, tonsils, that's all that head and neck region, 80% uh, of those are squamous cell cancers. Uh, and about 50% of those, so you can, you know, are related to the HPV-16. Now we know if you have a uh, cancer, regardless of the location, um, that is HPV-16 positive, we know those patients generally have better outcomes um, than if it's not, but we still treat it and we still have to do the same treatments. So if we can prevent them, that's always best. And again, it might take years to decades for a cancer to develop from an HPV infection. Uh, and how do we treat HPV? This is just in general again, we cannot cure it, but treatment can help. The warts may just spontaneously go away on their own. Um, and many people don't actually develop symptoms, but they can still infect others through sexual contact. And then the treatment focuses on actually removing those warts, um, regardless of where those warts are at. Creams, you can freeze it with liquid nitrogen, you could electrocautery, which is a form of burning, um, some dermatologists just surgically remove them or laser treatments are also available. Again, the vaccines that we have are very helpful in preventing the most common strains, which is that HPV 16 and 18 um, cancers. <clears throat> so what are the vaccines? I know there's a lot of talk in the news right now about vaccines. Um, but that's for the coronavirus vaccine. That's a whole different subject than what we're into right now. Um, so the HPV vaccine, this has been out for many years. Uh, I want to say probably at least five to 10 years that the HPV vaccine has been available. When it first came out, they were only available to adolescent girls. We thought, you know, let, let's just prevent the cervical cancers and the female cancers that are related to HPV. So these are some of the, a couple of the brand names of the vaccines. Um, and what HPV infections that they target? You know, how can they help prevent these? So you can see that the HP, the Cerevax um, helps prevent the HPV 16 and 18. The Gardasil uh, prevents 16, 18, 6, and 11. Um, infections. And then the Gardasil 9 uh, prevents, helps prevent a total of nine HPV infections, 16, 18, 11, 6, and then 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. Uh, honestly, in my time of working with cancer patients, we really only are kind of concerned about that HPV 16. Um, that's the one that we really test for when it comes to a cancer. And what are the guidelines for HPV vaccines? Most of the guidelines out there are for adolescent children. Um, ages 11 to 12 is right around when you should start getting those kids um, tested, but they have actually increased um, to the age of 26. So if you were, you know, maybe mom and dad said, no, I don't want you to have the vaccine, but you're 24 and you say, you know what, I'm in a new relationship right now. Maybe I should start, maybe I should get the vaccine. Even though you're 24, talk to your primary care about that and see what they recommend based on your history. Um, the shots typically are a series of two or three injections over a period of time. And of course the two or three injections depends on when you actually start receiving the vaccine. Um, if you're immunocompromised, so cancer patients, you know, I, that's because I work in the cancer world, that's usually what I think of, of 
for an immunocompromised patient. But like I said, there can be many other reasons patients can be immune compromised. Um, if you start at the age of nine to 15, the second dose is usually given about six to 12 months after the first dose. And if you receive two doses or less than five, uh, than five months apart, then you should get a second dose. Uh, if you don't start getting the vaccine until age 15, that second dose is given you know, one to two months after that first dose. And then the third dose is given uh, right around that six month time point from the second dose. And then age 27 to 45, here's where the CDC really has come out and said, we recognize these people. This is a new group of people that we're not, haven't seen previously. So this really does require a discussion with your physician. And these are patients or people that, you know, maybe they were married, they only had one sexual partner, well, now they're divorced or they're widowed or, you know, and they're going to be back out into um, potentially that sexual scene with new people, you know. So they are saying that the vaccine could help these patients as well. So that's where it's really important to have that discussion with your physician as to whether or not it would help or not um, prevent any things. Uh, certainly contraindications and uh, precautions as with many vaccines, this is kind of, you know, kind of goes for all vaccines. Of course, any vaccine can cause an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, we do not recommend because of the way sometimes these uh, vaccines are um, in pre-filled syringes. If you have a latex allergy, you might want, not want to get that vaccine it, that's given from a pre-filled syringe. A um, couple of the vaccines, the quadrivalent and the quadrinivalent, those are produced actually with baker's yeast. So if you have an allergy to yeast, probably shouldn't get that vaccine either. Um, if you have a moderate or se acute uh, severe illness, um, you wanna wait until those symptoms resolve. You know, even if you're due for that second dose, you know, call your doctor and say, you know what, I've been sick these last few days. I really don't think I should be coming in. You know, of course we don't want you to get the vaccine while you're sick. If you just have a minor illness, you know, just like a, little cold or something like that. Now, this is before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, so if, if you just have a little minor respiratory infection, you could probably still get that vaccine. Um, but right now with coronavirus, that may play a different factor. Um, of course, if you're pregnant, we do not want you getting the um, HPV vaccine either. And then potential side effects, the most common adverse reactions are local reactions. So if you get your flu shot every year, you can kind of, you know, you know when you get that flu shot, and it causes a little discomfort, pain, redness, or swelling right there where they did the injection at. Same thing with the HPV vaccine. Uh, if you have a temperature, it can, or it can cause a temperature for a couple days afterwards. Um, but we kind of found in the clinical trials that both placebo and the actual vaccine could cause this temperature. So no, nothing really that stuck out to us. And then you could have some nausea, some dizziness. Um, but again, those symptoms could also showed up when we did the trials for the placebo patients. So it's not anything that you know, is really specific to the HPV vaccine. And there's been no serious adverse events associated with the vaccine. Now, of course, they're monitoring it. They're continuing to monitor the vaccines and, you know, what side effects patients are having once they've received it, but there's no serious adverse reactions to it that they've found. Uh, so what are we seeing as far as the cancer end of things? 91% of all cervical cancers are coming from an HPV infection. So if we can eliminate the HPV infections through these vaccines, we can decrease our number of cervical cancers. Same with the oropharyngeal cancers or 
uh, cancers of the head and neck region, 72% of those are from the HPV vaccine, or I'm sorry, HPV infection. So again, if we can reduce our HPV infections, we can therefore reduce our cancers. You know, infections are one thing, but when we have a cancer, that becomes a whole nother serious health risk and health issue. So would much prefer to prevent a cancer than having to deal with that cancer once it's developed. 14 million people are infected with the HPV um, from the American Cancer Society. 31,000 are diagnosed with cancer caused by HPV yearly. So that's about 13,000, almost 14,000 patients with cervical cancer. 1% um, increased, another risk factor is 1% increase for head and neck cancer in white men and women. Why that is, why we're seeing that, we're not sure. Uh, that's something that they're continuing to look at. But again, if we can prevent the HPV infection, then we're going to be able to prevent some of these cancers. I'm not going to say we're going to prevent them all, um, but certainly we can prevent some of them if we can prevent that HPV infection from ever forming. And that's what the vaccines are meant to do. So the vaccines are not meant to prevent the cancer, so to speak. It's meant to prevent the infection that can cause the cancer. So it's kind of a twofold um, benefit. Uh, of course, if we continue with the vaccinations with the adolescents, we're reducing those uh, anogenital warts, which for any teenager, that would be embarrassing, whether or not you know, they're having sexual activity anyways. Um, we're reducing the cervical cancers and even non-cervical HPV associated cancers. And there is a definite, a definite cost savings um, versus non-vaccination. So when they looked at the cost savings for people receiving the vaccines versus the ones that have not received vaccines and maybe developed these conditions, whether it was a cancer or not, there was definitely a cost savings over the long run um, for the people that had the vaccine. Uh, now the CDC has extended the vaccination recommendations to the age of 45. Again, this comes into play for those people that, like I said, um, you were in a long-term relationship with somebody and now that relationship has ended, whether it's just ended or you know, divorce, widowed, whatever that case may be. And now you're gonna be back out into the dating scene and potentially um, having sexual activity with other people. This is where that conversation with, the phys with your physician as to whether or not it's going to really help you. Um, because you, know, you may have had an HPV infection at a younger age and you didn't know it. Your body was able to clear it on its own. Um, so there is a higher cost per quality adjusted lifespan um, or life year with the HPV vaccine. Um, but again, if we can potentially help prevent a cancer, that's huge. We want to be, be able to help prevent a cancer, if at all possible. Uh, so it is recommended for that shared decision-making with your physician, if you're between the ages of 27 to 45. Really have that conversation with them uh, because you may be at risk if you weren't previously active. And again, like I was saying, if you're in a divorce setting, a widowed setting, um, the actual public health benefit for this age range, it's minimal. But if you're one of the people that we've prevented a cancer, then that's huge. You know, we, we want to be able to prevent that. And again, just have that conversation with your physician. You know, they should be aware of these uh, new guidelines um, so have that conversation with your doctor and then sometimes, not always for this age bracket, they should, may be covered by health insurance, you know, for this age bracket. Again, they may not be, but that's where that conversation needs to have. And I apologize, I don't know what a normal uh, vaccination series would be without health insurance coverage, but I think it's certainly worth 
checking into if you're in that situation. And then there are my reasons for vaccinating. I can honestly tell you both my kids, my daughter is now 21, my son just turned 19. They had these vaccinations. They had the two to three shots. I don't remember how frequently. Um, and my son, my daughter was like, yeah, okay, mom, no problem. My son was like, I hate shots. I don't want to get them. Um, and I just kind of looked at him and I said, you know what, son, if I can prevent a cancer in you, and then hopefully that's going to prevent a cancer in a female, hopefully he's not sexually active, but you know, we can't take that under assumption either, you know, so, and he did it reluctantly, but he did it. So that's why I feel vaccinations are so important because we're not only protecting our children, we're protecting our future, hopefully daughter-in-law, son-in-law, you know, we're protecting other people as well. So this is why I'm so passionate about the vaccinations for HPV. So that ends my uh, talk. If there's any questions, I'm open to any questions that you have.